hard to reach areas. Um, so they they are small. Uh, you know, obviously the adults. This is a male. This is a female. They're going to be easier to see because they're darker and they're larger. Um, but even then, if they're you know biting in kind of a, a hard to see area, it might not be noticed. All right, so this is a busy slide, but it's showing how we're going to have transmission occurring between animals and people and how the tick plays the, the important role in this transmission. So imagine you have a tick um, larva and remember the tick larva has to take a blood meal in order to mature into the nymph. And they're going to take their blood meals from small uh, mammals. Um, you know, they're they're smaller themselves. They're going to take they they prefer to take bites from smaller mammals. So um, different types of rodents. Um, as I said previously, the white-footed mouse is um, a very common carrier for for Borrelia. So let's say that this mouse here is infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, and a nymph. Uh, excuse me, a larva takes a blood meal from this uh, white footed mouse. When that happens, that tick can become infected with Borrelia itself. Now, remember that the tick is then going to have to take additional blood meals um, to further progress itself in its life in its life cycle. So after the blood meal from the mouse, it's going to develop into the nymph. But in order for the nymph to develop into an adult, it needs to take another blood meal. So it could take a blood meal from, um, let's say taking a blood meal from a human. And if it picked up the Borrelia from the mouse, then it could also then transmit the Borrelia to the human. And then once it takes that blood meal, then it's going to develop into an adult and that adult could then transmit to another human or transmit to perhaps a larger animal like like a deer. Um, and then once it does that, it can mate and it can lay eggs and kind of the whole cycle is going to start over again. When, when a tick moves from one phase of the cycle to the next phase of the cycle, it does not lose the the infection. So if a larva becomes infected at the larval stage with Borrelia burgdorferi, it's going to stay infected through its uh, adult life. And so it could then be transmitting along its life cycle as it's taking these various blood meals. Um, so this is how the, um, the bacteria Borrelia burgdorferi um, remains present in our environment. It continuously cycles between the ticks, between small and large mammals and humans. All right, so one thing that is important to know about ticks is that they don't fly and they don't jump. Um, what they do is they hang out on the end of um, grasses or leaves and they, they look very much like this. This is called questing. Um, you'll see kind of the, the front legs here um, spread open wide. And basically what this tick is doing is it's waiting for a host to brush past. So because they can't fly or jump, they really, they need to come in contact with the animal or the human. And once that happens, then they can, then they're going to grab hold and they're going to very often try to find kind of a hard to reach area and then it can it can bite the individual. It is important to, to know that these guys do like to find the more hard to reach areas. Um, so it might be hidden in hair. So here's an example of a tick that's embedded in someone's head. And uh, you know, especially individuals that have long hair, you know, this is gonna be something that's that's hard to miss. Or, or, or um it's gonna be easy to miss, you know, if you have hair covering it up. Um, here's a really interesting picture where the tick, it, it may be hard to see, but there is a tick that is embedded in this um, child's eyelid. Um, Ew. 
And so, yeah, so there can be some, some interesting places that they um, embed themselves and it can be anywhere on, on the human body it can attach anywhere, but it does like those hard to reach places. It kind of likes that, you know, behind the ears, behind the knees and the waistband and the groin, those types of places it's going to seek out um, because it doesn't want to be found. You know, it wants to take its blood meal. So what the- Donna, we have a question. Oh, sure. Okay. So Dave asked how many blood meals is typical from going from one stage to another? O only one blood meal is needed. So there's going to be a blood meal between um, larva and nymph, another blood meal between um, nymph and adult, and then the adult is going to take a blood meal before it mates and lays eggs. So it's only one blood meal. Um, and those are taken in between those those different parts of the life cycle. And how long do they live? What is the length of their life cycle? So they they live um, a couple years. Uh, that oh. that whole that whole cycle takes two years of time. Um, wow! So they 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 live longer than some other insects. You know, some right. only last a few weeks, but. The ticks can can live for um, it, the whole cycle takes two years, um, and so they're obviously they're alive during that that whole time period. Um, so what's going to happen is the tick is going to find skin, and it's going to you know use the the its little pincers, and it's going to embed itself into the individual skin. And then this is not like a mosquito that, you know, takes a blood meal really quickly. Ticks will stay attached to their host for several days and, you know, very slowly extract blood. And you can see um, an example of a tick that has uh, become engorged here with, with an individual's blood. Um, and this, like I said, this is going to happen slowly over uh, several days time. One thing that is important to recognize is that the longer the tick is attached, if it is infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, the more likely it is that that bacteria is going to be transmitted. So if you can get to a tick shortly after it's bitten an individual and remove it, then you have a less, much less likelihood of Move of actually developing Lyme disease, um, because if you can remove it quickly, it's less likely that the Borrelia burgdorferi was able to be transmitted from the tick to the human. Once the tick sucks blood for several days, then it's going to, to drop off and it's gonna prepare for its next stage of the life cycle. Um, I have this picture here, this is, um, one of my kids and this this tick was actually really easy to see because it it was on his belly um and i was able to remove it really quickly i knew he had been running around kind of in a wooded area and uh, you know a couple hours later we came home and um i wasn't i wasn't really thinking anything about ticks at the time um but once i saw the tick i was it was like, oh yeah, he ran through kind of this wooded area um, that was next to a parking lot that we were in. And um, so that's how he got the tick attached to him, but I was able to remove it quickly. And I knew that he wasn't going to become infected with Lyme disease because of how quickly I was able to remove the tick. <clears throat> All right, so once the bite occurs, and if that tick is infected with Borrelia burgdorferi, then the individual can become infected with the bacteria as well and can develop Lyme disease. The symptoms are not going to develop right away. Um, now, it could be as early as three days, but it could also be as late as 30 days. So I think it's important to recognize that you could develop symptoms, you know, three weeks after you were exposed to kind of a, a wooded area, and you might not even be thinking about that because it just, you know, it happened a while ago. So it it can take the symptoms, um, you know, weeks to develop. So do keep that in mind. 
And the, the, uh, the symptoms that develop are typically um, more nonspecific, like headache and fever, muscle and joint pain and fatigue, um, which could be attributed to many different things. But there is one symptom that is um, very specific to Lyme disease, and that is a rash that's called erythema migrans. Now, this is not going to happen in every single individual. It happens in about 7 to 80% of individuals that develop Lyme disease. Um, but this rash is very characteristic, and it's the it's this rash that often prompts people to think, oh, uh, you know, maybe I have Lyme disease. Or it's also the rash that would prompt a physician or, you know, any medical provider to say, oh, this is something I really need to be considering here. So this are, these are some examples of what erythema migrans looks like. When you read about erythema migrans in a textbook, it talks about this kind of classic presentation that looks like a, a target with this bullseye in the center. <clears throat> but you can see from these other pictures that that's not always what it looks like. So it can take on a different look depending on the individual. The, the rash is going to, to start at the site of the tick bite and then it's gonna expand slowly over um, a number of days. So kind of an expanding rash is another clue that it could be erythema migrans. And you know, it might look like this, this target lesion that we see here, but it might be, um, it might not. So, you know, in this individual, it's the, the lesion is kind of completely red throughout without that target lesion. And, you know, in this individual, it almost is taking on more of a, like a bluish hue. Um, you know, in in um, this individual, it looks smaller. This might be kind of the start of the rash, and then it's going to expand over the next few days. Um, here, you can see that there isn't. There's kind of this inner um, lightning inside, but you don't really see that target spot. So, kind of the the main point here is that it's not always going to look like this. So. If a rash doesn't look like this, that doesn't not, that doesn't mean that it's not erythema migraines. It can look different in different people, and it can also be more uh, difficult to identify in individuals that have darker skin. Um, so that's important to keep in mind um, about erythema migraines. I, I see we have a question. Okay, let's see. Thomas, I'm going to unmute you. Okay, Thomas. Oops. Okay, Thomas, can you hear me? <laughs> Thomas, did you have a question with your hand raised? Is your volume? Uh, oh, oh, I can hear you a little bit. Starting to hear. Yeah, if he could turn the volume up, that would be great. Uh, okay, on the, the computer? computer? On the computer? We, yeah, we, we hear, hear you now. now. Okay, all right. Uh, let me see. If, did that help? Yes. yes. Okay, yes. Uh, back in 2019, uh, I got bit. Um, I was hiking with a friend. And my rash kind of looked like the second one down the big red patch. Okay. So I went to my doctor and uh, they did the test, I guess, this titer test or something. Mm -hmm. And he said it came back positive. And I think, uh, what is the standard thing they do when you've been tested positive for it? Do they usually give you an antibiotic for it? Yes. This? Yes. And uh, how long do you have to usually take the antibiotic? And, and what is the name of that antibiotic? Uh, does that so, usually kill the infection or, or what? Um, so you take it, typically it's two to four weeks of antibiotic. Uh, the most typical antibiotic given is uh, doxycycline, but it may differ depending on whether you have allergies or whether you're on other medications that, you know, can't be taken with doxycycline. 
So there's that's not the only one, but that is kind of the, the go to if an individual can take it. And if it's caught early enough, um, you know, typically the the infection will will resolve. The, the antibiotic will take care of the infection. OK, because um, I know when I got bit that uh, summer, it was just. Uh, I was just totally fatigued, wore out. It just seemed like I ached everywhere, you know, and you know, my body okay. ached, my joints. It was hard getting in out of bed. It was horrible, you know. I just couldn't do a lot of social functions. I mean, I was really out of it. It, you, it sounds like you have a lot of the classic symptoms with fatigue and muscle ache and joint pain. Um, those are all those are our classic symptoms. But those are those could be symptoms of other things as well. But since you had the rash as well, then that was a really, you know, telltale sign. Okay. And just lately, um, a couple of weeks ago, I went hiking again with a friend. It was in the afternoon, sometime between 2 to 4 p.m. Came back home and just before I went to bed. Um, I looked in the mirror in the medicine cabinet and I saw a little black thing. You know, I thought it was like a mole on my neck. I was going to touch it and it was a bug. And I grabbed the bug and I squished it with my fingers and washed it down the sink. But the more I thought about it, I said, the deer ticks are not supposed to attach to you, you know? And I kind of wondered if it was a deer tick, but I haven't noticed any rash on my body, you know? Okay, well, that that's good. If you, if you were, even the, the way you just described that you, um, that you removed it is not the best way. And yeah. the, the best way is really to get a tweezer and kind of grab as close as you can to the skin and, and kind of pull up at a 90 degree angle from, from the skin to kind of pull those pincers out. Right. Um, but it sounds like you did it relatively quickly after your hike. So that really decreases the risk of transmission. It's the ticks that are embedded for, you know, 24, 48, 72 hours that are going to be, you know, as you increase your time, the likelihood of transmission is going to increase if that tick was infected. Now, not all ticks are going to be infected. Um, so you could have been bitten by a tick that wasn't infected with Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, but if, you, but say it was, removing it quickly is one way you can really decrease your risk. Okay, because I saw a, a naturopathic doctor on Monday and I told her about it and uh, she said um, if you have gotten bit, a deer tick usually embeds its head in your skin and it's hard to pull that tick off of you if you've been bit. Yeah, but, uh, you I didn't feel anything where I had to pull anything off or it was embedded in my skin, you know, <laughs> and it came off fairly easy. You know? Okay, so it might, it, maybe it wasn't a tick. Maybe it was a, a different type of insect. Okay, yeah, but I, I after, when I pulled it off, I had, I wasn't thinking about a deer tick, you know. But afterwards, I remember, look at I know about the deer ticks and the Lyme disease that they do like to attach to your body, and they, I guess, they like to stay there. They do. I'm assuming this yes. bug maybe could have been there since. 2 to 4 p.m. when we were hiking up until about 11 at night. That, that's, yeah. still, that's still pretty, that's still pretty quick though. So if you remove it within kind of 24 hours of being bitten, then you're going to have um, less chance of transmission occurring. But it, yeah, if you felt like it really wasn't kind of embedded in your skin, um, cause they really, they use their little pincers to kind of grab hold and they kind of like embed the, the front part of their, their body. I'm not an entomologist, so I'm probably not using the right terminology, but they kind of embed that their, um, the front part of their body kind of right in the, in the skin. Yeah. Your, your presentation is very good, Shauna. Oh, thank um, you. Thank you for sharing your experience. It's always good to hear from people who have experienced it for themselves. Uh, I wonder, um, 
you still get symptoms of the Lyme disease year, like years after being bit with it, like in my case, three, four years, like mental problems or, or stuff like that, or, or you know. So um, we're actually gonna talk about that in, in a little bit. So if you can, if you can hold off, um, we're actually gonna get to that in a few minutes. I have oh. a slide on that, okay? All right, so I'm looking on the computer. I'm not real computer savvy, but I know they said uh, click the, the hand button when you want to ask a question. And yes. the, the little cartoon button, you click that to uh, get my volume where you can hear me. Um, the volume would be kind of below the chat. That, that bubble is the chat bubble where you can type in a message. Below that, you should have your sound. Oh, but no, we can I just, hear you now. Okay, yeah. No it's problem. just this chat. And it's got like a blue button over on the top of it. and uh, Just a circle in front of chat and a few little dots. That's... Oh, the three little dots next to it are um, just panel options. So I would stick with the chat or raise your hand for questions. Okay. All right. Yes. Thank you so much. Seth. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. So we do have a couple more questions in the chat box. Um, I can't believe your son had a tick. I'll just add that. But um, wow. Uh, the question here is, how do you get a tick off your body? And the second question kind of flows with that. What happens if you don't get the whole tick off you, if some of it's still inside? Yeah, so um, I wish I had a, I should have included a, a picture of this because I, I, I didn't. Um, so that's actually a, a note for future presentations that I'll include a picture of this. But what, what you really want to do is you want to take a pair of tweezers and you want to grasp the tick as close to the skin of the person as possible. And then you don't wanna pull at an angle, you really wanna pull straight up and you wanna, so you're gonna kind of pull it at 90 degrees from the individual's uh, skin. And, and you might have to, you know, put a little effort into it. I, I remember when I was removing my, my son's tick, I mean, the, even though it had only happened a couple hours ago, it's little pincers were already in his skin. So you really have to kind of, you know, give it a, a nice tug. And, um, and then that if you, if you do that, if you put the tweezers right next, next to the skin, that's how you avoid not pulling the whole thing out. So if you, if you put the tweezers kind of in the middle of the tick's body and try to pull that way, then it's possible that the whole thing won't, wouldn't come out. And then you'd have to be trying to go back and remove the rest of the tick. That's why you wanna take the tweezers and get them as close to those, the pincers next to the skin as possible, and then pull up at a 90 degree angle. So, um, so that's how you're gonna want to remove it. If, you, if the whole thing doesn't come out and you, know, you think that you can remove the second part on your own you can do that but if you think you're going to end up really injuring yourself um, by doing that then i would you know recommend you know going to see your medical provider but if you do it right the first time you should be able to pull the whole thing out in in one piece all right so let's um Let's move on here. So actually, we talked about this a little bit already with Thomas's question, but the good thing about one of, I mean, obviously Lyme disease is not good, but one good thing about the situation is that we do have a way to treat it. And so since it's caused by a bacterial agent, we can use antibiotics to, to treat Lyme disease. Um, and like I said previously, um, doxycycline is one of the, the, the go-tos for treating Lyme disease. Um, but there may be other antibiotics used as well. And if it's caught um, early on, that's what you really wanna do. You wanna try to catch it early. Most people are going to recover quickly and they're going to recover completely and they're not going to have any 
you know, issues in, in the future. However, that is not true of everyone. There's something called post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome, where an individual can continue having difficulty with either um, pain or fatigue, um, sometimes mentation issues like thinking can um, keep occurring six or more months after the treatment. And this can affect um, up to about 20% of those infected. The, the challenging thing about post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome is that it's not well understood. It's not understood, the, ca the cause is not understood. Um, we do know that if these individuals are, are treated, you know, treating them with different antibiotics or more antibiotics or, you know, more concentrated antibiotics doesn't help. Um, and unfortunately, there isn't any treatment for post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome. It's really going to be, um, you know, working with a provider to just to manage the symptoms. Um, so, you know, this is something to keep in mind as well. And, you know, unfortunately, this is, uh, you know, a subject that really needs more research to um, done so that we can better understand the cause and, and better understand how we can treat individuals that continue to have symptoms, you know, months after their infection. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to talk a little bit about what we call the epidemiology of Lyme disease. So basically, I'm looking at the numbers and how Lyme disease is distributed in populations and, um, you know, by population characteristics. So what we're looking at here is um, we're looking at the reported cases of Lyme disease by year, looking at uh, a couple decades of time from 1998 to 2019. So across our our uh, horizontal axis here, we have years starting in 1998. This is when the uh, Centers for Disease Control first started um, um, collecting data on this. And then along our vertical axis, we have cases in, in the thousands. So when someone is diagnosed with Lyme disease by their medical provider, that medical provider is required to report that to the, the county health department, which is so in, in our case, that would be the Erie County Health Department, which is then gonna um, send that information up to the state level. And the state is gonna send that information up to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention so they can collect all that data and understand what's happening across the nation. So that's what we're looking at. We're looking at that data here. And kind of one thing to notice is that over the past two decades, we've really been kind of trending up in terms of um, in terms of the number of cases. Um, you can see that in uh, 2008, they also started collecting data on probable cases. So these were cases that were very likely to have been Lyme disease, but they were never confirmed. Um, but the big thing that is important to recognize about these numbers is that it turns out that Lyme disease is really underreported. So even though kind of in the last few years here, we see around, you know, 35,000 cases happening annually in the United States, we, we think that it's actually about eight to 10 times higher than that. So it's very likely that about 300,000 cases are happening every year in the United States. It's just that many, many cases never get reported. So it's a very underreported um, disease. So it's a so we see these numbers, but it's actually a bigger problem than um, than what these numbers are telling us. Uh, Shauna, we do have two more questions here in the box. Okay. Um, do uh, do these rashes always clear up completely or, um, hang on a second, <laughs> or can they leave some changed appearance to the area where you were bitten? This woman has something and she's wondering if it's evidence of a rash oh. from an earlier bite. 
you know, so oh. there's like a scar almost or a difference in the skin tone, I would imagine. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think in most people it, it, it clears up, but everyone kind of has different skin and some people are more likely to have a, develop scars or um, have something called keloid tissue, which is like scar tissue develop. And so it may be that that some people do have some um, like lasting visual, um, you know, evidence of the rash, but it, but in most people it's going to, it's going to resolve and then you're not going to see it anymore. Okay, and does winter help to lessen the tick population? Yes, yes. So um, there's specific, so that life cycle that we talked about, it takes two years of time and kind of during the kind of spring, summer, fall months is where in the life cycle those blood meals are happening. And so during the, the winter, ticks are, are not tending to be taking blood meals. Again, I'm not an entomologist, so I don't kind of fully, you know, know exactly what is happening in the life cycle, but I think they're more in a kind of a state where they're just transitioning from one um, stage to the next. And so we just, we don't have as much tick activity during that time. So that's why you're you're definitely going to see more cases in the warmer months because that is when you know not only are ticks more active but also that's when people are outside. So you know in the winter time, especially in the areas where we see a lot of cases, well people aren't outdoors as much, and so you're not having these situations where a person are coming in contact with um, with ticks. Um, so, okay. yeah, so, so this is showing us where the reported cases are coming from. And this is um, information from 2019. This is the most recent data that the Centers for Disease Control has made available to the public. They'll probably likely, you know, very soon coming out with some more recent data. But each of those blue dots, it represents one case of Lyme disease that has been reported in, and so the dot is put into the county where the case was reported from. And you can clearly see that the cases are, are you know, very concentrated in the Northeast and in the, in the upper Midwest. Um, and one of the reasons why we see this is because that is where the black-legged tick is quite abundant. So we have a lot of the vector circulating. Um, so, in terms of New York State, they do, you can um, get state data from the Centers for Disease Control as well. They, they make that data publicly available. So, in New York State in 2019, we had about 2,800 confirmed Lyme disease cases and about 1,400 probable cases. But what we have to keep in mind is that this is going to be very unreported. So it's, you know, it's very likely that we had, um, you know, numbers, um, numbers much higher than this. So even eight to 10 times higher than what actually was reported. So we do have a significant number of cases that are happening in New York State. Okay, so what I wanted to show you here is this is how the cases are distributed by age. So along our, our horizontal axis here, we have age groups from um, like in, in uh, blocks of five years. So zero to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, et cetera. And all the way down at the end, we have 85 plus. And um, along our vertical axis, we have number of cases. Again, kind of this um, the turquoise kind of color. I'm not sure what I would call this color, but this kind of dark turquoise green color is the confirmed cases, and then this more um, yellowy greeny color is the probable cases. But what you can see clearly when you look at this is you see kind of this bimodal peak where there's a peak um, in kind of the childhood years from you know five to, to fourteen. And then we see kind of another peak um, in the kind of 50 to 75 year old age group. Um, so, but, but, you know, it's not 
entirely clear why this is, but it's really it's thought that these groups of individuals are are in situations where they are more likely to come into contact with ticks. Because if you think about kids, you know, kids are playing outside a lot of the summer. Um, and so they have, you know, opportunities to come in contact with ticks. They may be running outside without any, um, you know, any type of bug repellent on. And then the same holds true for individuals kind of in this um, 50 to 75 year old age group. You know, maybe they, they finally got all the kids out of the house and they can finally do some of the things that they've always wanted to do, which may include activities outside like gardening or hiking. Um, and so they actually, or, or they, they've just retired and now they can you know, take the opportunity to be in the outdoors more. Um, and so just, you know, more opportunities to come in contact with the, with the vector. Um, so it is, we do see uh, more cases occurring in, in the older populations. Okay, now this is, this is really important because what you want to do is you just you don't want to get bitten by a tick to begin with. So, you know, prevention is, is the best way that we can. Um, prevent Lyme disease, or, you know, preventing a tick bite is the best way we can prevent Lyme disease. So there's various things that you can do. Um, you know, some of these are easier. Some of these are a little bit more difficult, but um, I'll, I'll talk about them for a few minutes. So, you know, one thing you can do is if you're, if you're going to, for a hike and you're going to be in close contact with um, wooded areas, um, like long grasses or um, you know, um, bushy, um, uh, like bushes with a lot of leaves on them. You might want to think about covering as much skin as possible. Um, you know, you could use light clothing to do that, but if you cover your skin, then you're going to be less likely to have a tick be able to, you know, embed itself into your skin. Um, you also can use insect repellent, which is going to help keep the, uh, the ticks away. And then kind of another really good uh, piece of advice is that say you're hiking um, on a trail. And if you can, if you can walk down the trail without uh, brushing your body up against the vegetation that is growing there, you're going to decrease your risk because remember that ticks don't, they don't jump, they don't fly, they're not going to hop. They really need you to brush your body against them in order for them to kind of grab hold with those legs. Um, so if you're not brushing up against the vegetation, then this is going to be a way you can um, prevent the bites because they're just not going to attach to your skin. So really try to stay centered in the middle of trails to avoid the ticks that are what we call questing, which are, you know, they're looking for a, for a host to grab onto. And then also really important is if you come in from a hike or where you've you know been in that type of area, um, you know a woodsy area, you're you're going to want to do a tick check, and you're going to want to make sure that you're you're paying attention to those kind of hard to see or hard to reach places, um, because they will attach in these strange places like armpits and scalps and in the groin area, even in the ears. Um, and, uh, and, and so if you can identify those quickly, like I said, even if you've been already been bitten, but if you can identify it quickly and remove it quickly, then you're going to really significantly decrease your, your chances of, um, having Borrelia burgdorferi transmitted into your bloodstream because it does take some time. Um, so, you know, this is just a reminder to check those hard to reach places, the scalp, the ears, the back of the neck, even, you know, they can get in, they might crawl under your waistband, um, in the groin area, under the arms, behind the knees. Those are all kind of very common places. Um, and then this is just, this is just to be silly that can you imagine having to uh, check a Chewbacca for ticks? That would be quite the job. All right, so that is what I have on tit on um, excuse me on Lyme disease. I'm going to be moving on to West Nile virus, but if anyone had, but actually we're kind of running low on time. Um, so Kitty, should I? What should I do here? Should I just kind of continue? The portion on West Nile is, is significantly shorter than the um, than the than the portion on Lyme. So maybe what I can do okay. is I can I'll, I'll if people want to stay on, I'll, I'm going to finish up. 
And then at the end, if people wanted to stay on to get questions answered, they can, but if they had to leave and, you know, go do something else, then, then they, they can log off at that time. Okay, we do have a couple questions on ticks here. Okay, so um, I can I can answer those and then um, I'll take all the West Nile questions at the end. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you have any tick kits available to be mailed out? I don't know if that's a question for me or you actually, but um I, I guess I'm I'm not sure what they're referring to. Maybe they're they referring to where you can have you can remove a tick and then have it have it tested for particular vector borne diseases. If that's if that's what the person is is asking. I, I personally don't have, have any of those and I I don't know if um Erie County Health Department does, but that's probably who you would want to contact would be the Erie County Health Department. They um they likely have a surveillance program. I mean, most most um, health departments have an entomology program where they're they're surveilling for these types of things. So they're taking yes. ticks, they're taking mosquitoes, and they're they're testing for, for vector borne diseases. Um, you know, I I I'm, I don't work for the health department. I'm um, a professor at UB, so I personally don't have access to those. But um, it's possible the health department does. And again, you could call that New York Connects 858-8526 and ask them to connect you to the health department. Kitty, did you say there was another question or was that it? Um, yes, I just was chat or texting oh. in the chat box. Um, another participant said his brother-in-law had suspected Lyme disease and later developed memory loss. Any studies to this effect? So, I mean, that that sounds like that individual um, might be experiencing neurologic complications from Lyme disease. There, there, there are neurologic complications that are associated with with um, Lyme disease and, and also individuals that have this kind of post-treatment uh, Lyme, Lyme disease syndrome. Some of those symptoms can be, um, you know, mental function um, um, symptoms like difficulty with memory, difficulty with thinking, um, brain fog, those types of neurologic symptoms. So that, is, that is possible. Okay. And then our permethrin treated clothing, I think I said that right. Oh, permethrin? Yes, treated clothing effective in keeping ticks away. Yes, they are um they are effective. Um in fact, the um many uh, not many, but some of the uniforms that are are made for our our military they're actually like in, they're actually embedded with with permethrin in them. So, um, you know, a tick will you know, land on the on the uniform, but then it within a, probably about thirty seconds or you know maybe forty seconds, the tick is going to die. So okay, so and then it, it may depend on the concentration. Um, I'm just kind of I'm familiar with the the clothing that's used by the U.S. military. Um, but I've actually, I've seen, um, uh, you can, and this is something you could probably Google if you, if you like to do that, but there's, there's videos you can find of, you know, putting a tick on a permethrin treated uniform and then, um, you know, within seconds, the, the tick is floundering and it's dead. And then this question, how would you quantify the volume of ticks? in different counties in Western New York? Like, why is there a difference? Oh, well, it has, like, why are there more black-legged ticks in Western New York? Um, that's probably more of an entomology question, and I'm not an insect scientist, but I, I, I there are many different species of ticks, and there's gonna be different species of ticks that, are going to be habitating different parts of the United States. So it's not that there aren't ticks in other parts of the country, but they they may be different species. 
And so it just so happens that kind of the, the climate here, the conditions here in the Northeast and in the upper Midwest are really conducive to, um, to the black legged tick. And so the black legged tick will, you know, thrives in this particular area. But there's other species of ticks that survive um, or thrive in, in other geographic areas. Okay. All right. So we'll continue on. If those who want to stay can stay, we'll keep using the chat, but we'll answer the questions at the end. And we'll hear now a little bit about West Nile. Okay, so West Nile is the second vector borne disease we're going to talk about. And the reason why I wanted to talk about West Nile, because this is the most common mosquito borne disease in the United States. So, the, so when we were talking about Lyme disease, of course, the vector was ticks. And now when we talk about West Nile, the vector is mosquitoes. So just some um, background information. Um, like I said, it is going to be a mosquito borne disease. And it's when individuals are bitten by a mosquito that is uh, carrying West Nile virus. And there's, since it's a virus, there's no special name like we saw for the bacteria. So bacteria have the, uh, use the binomial system of nomenclature with genus and species. So that's why um, the, pathogen that causes Lyme, we refer to it as Borrelia burgdorferi. Um, but with viruses, they're just called by their common name. So the West Nile virus is what causes West Nile disease. Um, so when a um, mosquito that is infected with the West Nile virus uh, takes a blood meal from an individual, they, they can transmit the West Nile to that individual and they may develop a febrile illness. And this illness can have symptoms, of course, fever, because it's a febrile illness, but also swollen glands. They may have uh, GI symptoms like nausea or vomiting. Um, also symptoms that are similar to, to uh, Lyme disease with muscle aches and, and joint pain. Um, unfortunately with West Nile, there isn't um, a very specific rash like we see with Lyme disease. It's more of kind of a generalized rash. Um, but, and so the symptoms can, can seem very similar. Um, so this is something, you know, there is no kind of telling, really telling symptom with, with, with West Nile, unfortunately. Um, when individuals do get infected, though it's important to recognize that actually most people are not going to get sick. So only about one in five are going to develop that febrile illness, um, where the remainder are not going to be symptomatic. We call that asymptomatic. And then there's also a more severe condition. It can cause, you know, very uh, severe illness with potentially death occurring as a result. This happens in about one in 150 individuals that are infected. So, you know, thankfully, that's a very small percentage of those infected. And um, unfortunately, there's also no treatment for West Nile virus. It's really going to just be a uh, supportive treatment. There's no antiviral that we can use. And, and since it is a virus caused by an, a viral agent, we can't use antibiotics to treat it because antibiotics are what we use to treat bacterial pathogens. Okay, so I, I want to talk a little bit more about this, this really scary form of West Nile, which is called neuroinvasive West Nile, or you may also hear it referred to as West Nile encephalitis. Um, and what is happening here is the, the brain is actually being invaded by the virus and it can cause swelling of the brain. And the, the medical term for that is encephalitis. You also could have swelling of the tissues that surround the brain. That's called meningitis. Um, some individuals have polio-like symptoms with a paralysis that occurs. Um, other symptoms that individuals may experience that are developing this really severe form include high fever, really severe headache, neck stiffness, neurologic symptoms like being disoriented or going into a coma, even having seizures. Um, and like I said, uh, paralysis as well. So some really significant severe symptoms associated with this. And also important is that 
individuals that are 60 years of age and older are going to be at greatest risk of neuroinvasive West Nile. And this is a severe illness. So one in 10 individuals is going to die from neuroinvasive West Nile. So this is something that you really wanna be aware of and you wanna be thinking about um, preventing mosquito bites so that you never become infected with West Nile virus. All right, so what this is slide is showing is it's showing kind of the distribution of uh, symptomatology that is associated with West Nile. So this is what we call a pie chart. And this uh, orange part of the pie here is representative of the individuals that are not going to develop any symptoms. So, you know, about 80, close to 80% of individuals are not going to develop symptoms. So that's a good thing. Um, and then about 20% are going to develop that more milder form of the um, West Nile virus. Now, I'm not saying that it's super mild, you know, people feel sick, um, but it's not that really, really severe form that we just talked about. So individuals that fall into this uh, portion of the pie, they're going to be the ones that are having um, kind of a milder fever, milder, milder, milder headache, body aches, fatigues, those types of symptoms where then you have less than 1%, like I said previously, about one in every 150 individuals infected will develop this really severe form of West Nile uh, virus disease um, with neurologic symptoms. And one, on, and one out of 10 of those individuals will die from, from the severe disease. All right, so I wanna talk a little bit about the transmission cycle of West Nile virus because um, this is how we have the virus kind of circulating in our environment is because it continues to be transmitted between mosquitoes and birds. So this is, um, mosquitoes can, what can happen is mosquitoes can take a blood meal from a bird. And if a bird is infected with West Nile virus, then the virus can be transmitted to mosquitoes. And then the mosquito can bite other birds um, or could bite humans or other types of mammals, um, specifically horses. And those um, humans and horses can also become infected. Um, but humans and horses are what we call a dead end host. So once a human is infected with West Nile virus, if a, um, an, in the future, well, after, you know, when they're infected, if they get bitten by another mosquito, they're not going to then transmit to someone else. So that's why um, humans are considered dead end hosts and also um, horses who can be infected with West Nile are also considered dead end hosts because no more individuals past these are going to be infected. But it's continuously maintained in our um, environment by the continuous transmission between mosquitoes and birds. All right, so like Lyme disease, um, the CDC, um, it keeps track of the number of cases of West Nile virus that are occurring, but it specifically is capturing the cases of neuroinvasive disease. So these are just the individuals that have the really severe form of West Nile virus. So when we look at these numbers, we have to recognize that there's a lot more people that got infected beyond just these individuals that we're looking at here because this is only neuroinvasive disease. So what we're looking at on this chart is on the horizontal axis, we have um, year. And the first year that West Nile virus, virus was reported in the United States was in 1999 in New York. And so that's why this graph starts at 1999. And then along our vertical axis, we have something called incidence, and this is a way for us to track the number of new cases in a population. Um, so you can see that there isn't, you know, it isn't a trend like we saw with um, Lyme disease where we kind of just saw this kind of slowly increasing trend. That's not what we've seen with, with West Nile. Now we've seen cases occurring in the United States every year since 1999, but some years it's lower than other years. Um, you kind of see a couple of peaks and then we have this kind of valley here and another peak and another valley. And it almost looked like it's kind of turning into like a wave-like 
um, scenario. But I think we're gonna we'll have to wait to see going forward if that if that continues or this is really just more more random. So we need to better understand um, the epidemiology the epidemiology of this and kind of a better understand the the number of cases that are occurring on an annual basis. But um, we do know that. About 26,000 cases of neuroinvasive disease have been reported since West Nile virus was first identified in the United States in 1999. And then this is also really important. I mentioned this previously, but what this graph is showing us is that the risk of that neuroinvasive disease really significantly increases as someone ages. So along our uh, horizontal axis, we have age grouping. So this is less than 10, 10 to 19, 20 to 29, et cetera, up to our 70 and older. And then this is incidence in the population. So a measure of the number of new cases of disease. And you can see this really significant trend upward. So that the risk of disease is is so much more the, the risk of neuroinvasive disease is so much more in individuals that are are um, are older and you can see it's it's um, the incidence is is quite quite low in in children and young adults but it really takes off as individuals age so that's why it's going to be important for um, for older individuals to be thinking about mosquito bite prevention. So how can we do that? Well, some of the ways we prevent tick bites are the same way we can prevent mosquito bites. Um, so, you know, dress, dress the right way. You know, sometimes it can be in the summer, it can be hard to wear long sleeves and long pants, but you know, there are types of materials that are that are lighter. And um, so you you if you cover your whole body, you're going to be less likely to be to be bitten. You also want to use a bug repellent. Um, and I, I, I didn't mention this when we were talking about Lyme, but you really want to look on the, the bottle of bug repellent. You want to make sure that it's registered by the Environmental Protection Agency and that includes ingredient like DEET, which is really going to um, it is going to protect you well. Um, Another thing that you can do to prevent mosquito bites is avoid being outside during their really peak activity time, which is at dawn and dusk. Um, again, that can be really hard in the summertime. You know, in the summer, people want to be out, um, you know, during all times of the day. But um, if you are going to stay out during dusk, um, and when it gets dark, you know, really think about making sure that your your skin is covered. Make sure you're thinking about applying that um, that bug repellent. And then there's also ways that you can um, decrease the number of mosquitoes that are in and around your house. So mosquitoes breed in standing water. So any type of standing water is going to increase the population of mosquitoes around your house. So if you have any type of buckets or you know. Uh, toys for your for your grandchildren that are filled up or tires, really anything that can cause water to um, to, to kind of um, stagnate in an area. That's a place where mosquitoes can breed. So you want to make sure all that is dumped so that you don't provide mosquitoes with a breeding ground. Um, and then you also don't want mosquitoes flying in your house as well. Um, so even though they're, you know, most um, uh, they're most active at dawn and dusk, you know, really they could fly in your house at any time of the day. So if you're opening windows, that's great, but you want to make sure that you've got screens on those windows so that uh, mosquitoes aren't flying into your house and actually um, biting you inside your home. So um, those are some additional ways you can prevent mosquito bites, but for both ticks and mosquitoes, think about how you're dressing, um, you know, think about um, making sure that you're applying um, bug repellent and and also kind of be thinking about the in, the environment. If you're in a wooded area, um, this is going to be an area where you're going to have um, ticks and and mosquitoes. Um, my my I I made a, a a big mistake. I sent my daughter to Allegheny and I forgot to give her bug repellent when she went a couple weekends ago, and she came home with 80 mosquito bites, probably more because we couldn't count them all. Um, but when you go to a like a camping area like that, 
there's going to be lots of mosquitoes. So that's when you really want to be uh, careful. So I really learned my lesson with my daughter. Um, next time I send her to Allegheny, I got to send her with loads of bug repellent. Um, so those are the kind of things that you want to be thinking about. Um, so that is all I have on West Nile. Um, but if anyone had any questions specifically about West Nile, I'd be happy to stay on to answer them. I know we went over the time, but I think, you know, I'm, for me, it's important for you all to get that information that you're you're interested in. Um, so I'm happy to stay on to answer questions. Okay, Shauna, thank you so much. Uh, great information and very important as well. Uh, if anyone has a question, I could, uh, if you hit your that hand button, then I can unmute you. Or we could use the chat box as well. Okay. Or if you type in the chat, if you don't want, if you don't know where the raise your hand button is, you could just text into the chat and I can uh, unmute you. Okay. It looks like um, Thomas ra raised his hand. I'm, I'm getting an okay. alert. All right. Thank you. I was just scrolling through. I didn't see him. Okay, Thomas, I'm going to unmute you. Thank you. There we go. Uh, what is the standard test to test for like the Lyme disease? Is it some kind of teeter test or something? Oh, you're probably thinking of a titer test where they're looking at um, antibody titers. So it's the test that they do, their, their blood tests that they do, where um, they're looking for either antibodies or what's called antigens, which are kind of portions of the, the pathogen. Um, so it is a, a blood test. And um, with Lyme, I believe that they do kind of a screening test first, and I think there's another test that is done um, after that for more confirmatory testing. Okay, so like if I got bit back in 2019, could that Lyme disease still stay in my body uh, or would I test negative for it? Well, it, it depends on what type of test you're, you're getting because some antibodies that are developed in um, in response to the infection can be more long lasting. And so you may still have an, the long lasting antibodies present. Um, but you know, at this point, you don't have the pathogen present anymore. So you don't actually have the, the, the bacteria that is you know, circulating in your bloodstream, but you may still have some of the antibodies that uh, are formed um, to respond to, to that infection that are, that are in your bloodstream. So if you have a and so there's there's different tests and it's it's actually kind of complicated. But so if you had a test that was done and it was identifying the longer lasting antibodies, then that test could could because you still have those antibodies. But at this point, you shouldn't. If you had a test that was uh, detecting the pathogen itself, then you shouldn't be able to detect the pathogen any longer because you had that infection. Um, you said like about three years ago. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. And like I said, I really but, haven't had any skin rash like the one I had in 2019. It was uh, near my leg, kind of really right near my groin, and it was a real large pink area. I haven't had any bad rash like that since. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't like to give up. See, when I do these talks, I'm pretty much always talking about some kind of infectious disease. So I, I don't really, I don't like to give out any medical advice. Um, so I think that if you, you know, if you did have a concern about anything, I would, I would definitely take it to your, whoever your primary care provider is. Um, right. but it, you know, it sounds like the situation that you were talking about with, with the bug that, um, this happened recently, 
that it, you know, it sounds like you haven't developed any symptoms yet. So that's good. And it sounds like it might not have even been a tick in the first place. So that's definitely good. Yeah. 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 So, well, thank you very much, Shauna. Your presentation was very good. And thank you. I think it's very needed here in this area because, you know, like I said, we're just probably flooded with ticks. And, yes. Um, it's important to know all this information. Yeah, and like I said, my one friend is like, that's the one thing on his mind. He just loves to hike, 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 you know. And, uh, you know, when I told him, I said, I just got to be cautious at my age because I'm 73 years old and I can't afford to, you know, maybe take the risk anymore. But yeah. um, if you're, uh, like I know I'm I'm close to Como Lake Park. If I just walk along like the road there, Como Lake Park, it wouldn't be too much of a risk for the deer ticks would there. Yeah, if you're not if you're not kind of brushing right up against the foliage, um, then it's gonna be less less risk because they really do need to kind of be hanging on to like a tall piece of grass or a leaf or you know, a bush and then kind of to grab on because they because they don't fly. Okay, yeah, because I'm trying to think of a couple other park areas where we commonly hike was um, like over at Reinstein Woods. Uh, I know the paths over there, it was like Victor Reinstein kind of made them like a road where a vehicle could travel down the, the road, you know. So you're not really close to any real high grass. Yeah, so sometimes that, that you have to mow idea. that road a little bit. But like over at the Stigamar Park, when you go over there, uh, the trails are a little more narrow and there's a lot of high grass uh, on both sides sometimes when you're walking. So I would assume that what you said, like the ticks kind of, uh, oh, they hang on at the end of the grass or leaves, mm -hmm. that they would probably be a little bit more dangerous place to hide. Good narrow yeah. trails it's going to be higher risk but with the, the wider trails would be if you if you want to hike i would choose the wider trails where you can walk down the center of the trail and mm -hmm. not actually brush up against the the foliage okay all right but i'm kind of trying to think um what did i do that day when i got bit with the ticket back in 2019 um in rice woods they do have some uh, benches in the park you know and this one bench we like to sit on, it's kind of close to the the lake there in Rhinestein Woods. And uh, you get a kind of a nice breeze there uh, off the lake on, on this bench. And we kind of sit there quite a bit. So I'm wondering if that could have been like the area where I got bit, you know? Yeah, certainly could have been. Yeah, because I mean, that's more like a, that's like a nature preserve. Um, like Victor Rhinestein donated the land to New York State, and uh, I know before it was a nature preserve, it was a private nature preserve, and they wouldn't even let people in there. So I think there's maybe probably less people on the trails there where you probably have more activity with mice, you know, and everything. And I know about five years ago, um, I think it was the Department of Conservation was really calling the deer herd because it was a huge deer herd in both Stigelmeyer and Rheinstein Woods a number of years ago. And you don't see as much deer in there, but I'm assuming with less humans, you might have more mice running around. You know, so. Yeah. Okay. Okay, we're going to uh, end the class there. It's almost noon, so thank you. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, and thank you, Thomas, for your questions. If anyone has any other questions uh, related to Lyme disease or West Nile, you can always contact the Erie County Health Department via that New York Connects number, 858-8526. And we will hear again um, from Shauna, she'll come back, I believe, for fall University Express classes. And we can, uh, you know, maybe go through the topic again of these two or discuss another topic. So everyone go out and enjoy your day.
I know I'm going to try to do the same. And stay safe. Bye, everyone.